welcome everyone. My name is Justine Gray, and I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, Professor Ann Cantrell, who will be presenting Sustainability and Apparel, Past, Present, and Future. Ann Cantrell is an Associate Professor in the Fashion Business Management Department at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, where she has helped develop the next generation of buyers, planners, product developers, and store management teams for the past 10 years, focusing on classes in sustainability, supply chain, leadership, and fashion forecasting. And I'm proud to say that I myself was one of those FIT students she helped shape. In the fashion industry, Anne worked in planning and then product development at companies including Brooks Brothers, Ralph Lauren, Talbots, and Coach. With an SMBA and a focus on both environmental and economic sustainability, Anne has also been a shop owner for the past 16 years in Brooklyn, New York. Her store, Annie's Blue Ribbon General Store, is a community staple in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Anne worked on the Fashion Entrepreneurship Textbook and has spoken and been a panelist on many events worldwide. Professor Cantrell, thank you for being here today and I will turn it over to you now. Fasting, thank you so much for that nice introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to everyone that's here. Very important topic that really can't be ignored. I just have a couple of slides and intro to tell you about today, and we're talking about sustainability, apparel, past, present, and future. But then I realized my the way that I was presenting it, I actually ordered it in present past and future. Tweaked things around because I think it's important to set up where we are now, um, where we came from, and what we have to where we're going in the future and some hope for that. So a little bit more about me. Thank you so much for that, Justine. I also just wanted to say that I started teaching um, a class in sustainability over a decade ago at FIT. And actually, I was asked to teach it, I think, more because my values aligned with the idea of sustainability more than my knowledge. My knowledge actually caught up along the way, and I did get my MBA with a focus on sustainability, as Justine said. But also, I've always just had sustainability and that ethos in my blood and my background. My husband kind of jokes that I grew up off the grid before there was a grid, and just always trying to be mindful of what I was buying and what I was consuming in the light that I also own a store as well. Speaking from experience, I work in the business school. So I'm always also looking at it from the lens of how are we going to make the business case for sustainability? Because that's really how things are going to catch on and to work and to really uh, make a difference. We could have a lot of lofty goals about what we might want to do in the in the future, but really, unless it's going to be uh, make sense from a business perspective, it's really not going to catch on. As I said, a little bit more about me in a moment, intro to sustainability and, and state of fashion for our agenda, explanation of how we got to this current state of affairs, what some ways the industry is working to think things around for the future. And then I'm hoping that you can also connect the dots for your customers so you remain relevant about changes that are coming as regulations are introduced and customer preferences are out there. So I'm going to go through all of these today. And I also just want to say that once you start learning about some of these things that we're going to talk about today, it's really hard to unlearn them. It's really hard to read and learn some of the statistics and then go out and go to Costco, for instance. Sometimes I'm blown away by how much product is out there. And it's also a lot of heavy things that we're talking about. I joke that like all my slides are trash because I have half of my slides are like landfills. Um, but it's important to know where all of the stuff that we're buying is going and particularly clothing and what it does to the environment when we throw things away, which just as a side note, we should never be throwing away any clothing. We should always try to take it to a textile recycler, donate it, something to definitely keep it out of the landfill. But also we're coming, we're talking about this topic in a really important time in our world. We, a lot of companies made really big 
goals about where they were going to be with regards to sustainability in prior to 2020. Fisher had a big vision 2020 about what the company was going to, what their vision for the brand was. Sorry, I'm going to skip ahead to some slides. What the, where the brand was going to be, but a lot of other brands too, not just really environmental stewards like Patagonia and Eileen Fisher, but other brands across the board. But they did so, most companies did so from the perspective of not having any science-based targets to go from. They didn't really even have a baseline to know how they could improve, right? If we're going to say what gets measured gets managed and that we're going to improve our greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to improve our labor practices, we're going to improve our um, supply chain and where things come from, we, we really have to know where we're coming from. And instead, companies just said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And none of that happened. And also along the way, COVID happened. And so a lot of the the goals really went out the window as business started to sputter out. Then we had major supply chain issues that I'm sure you are all very intimately familiar with. And then business started to rebound. So did social justice issues and other things like environmental, social, and governance, which you might see a lot, ESG goals uh, or ESG perspectives where companies were really focused on things like inclusivity, diversity, making sure that they were more checking out where things were being made throughout their supply chain. But that has really been to the wave side as well as businesses are really just trying to make sure that they're profitable and doing well from a business perspective. So we're at a really tough time in, in the world from that perspective where we need help more than ever before, but we're really caught in this quandary about what businesses need to do make to survive. And that's what Justine had said, that um, I come from a place of environmental sustainability, but also from the lens of economic sustainability, because we can't help the planet. We can't can't bring awareness. We can't make good, better choices if we're also not making money and creating a bottom line. So I don't want anybody to think that what I'm talking about today isn't also coming from a place of business where we also realize that we have to make money and to survive. But at the essence of what sustainability is, we're doing harm to the environment. There's no other way around it from a business perspective. So what we're really trying to do and talk about today is some why it's so important to the fashion, why it's so important to the fashion industry, why um, and what we can do uh, about it. But let's just start from the very beginning and let's talk about how our system currently works. We currently work on this linear system where we resource extractions, where we take, make, and dispose. We take things from the earth, we make them into something, and then we dispose of them. In many cases, the way that fast fashion has programmed a lot of people is that we wear things on average less than seven times, which is really an unbelievable statistic. I'm sure if you talk to your grandparents or even your parents, they'd be like, we used to buy things that lasted a long time. We would get shoes repaired. The number of cobblers for shoes has like dramatically decreased. I don't know if you've tried to get a pair of shoes fixed lately, but it's really hard. Uh, people just are programmed to go out and buy new shoes. Uh, this idea of this linear economy where we're just taking from the earth, making things and disposing things, is, is is a hard one is a finite system but we are where is a linear system that cannot run on a finite planet we are running out of resources we um, are running at one and a half times more resources than we have there is a lot of, we're now in 2024 there has been calls that we need to make take major action in our world from a climate perspective before 2030 time is ticking we're, we're getting close so this is a very important discussion and topic as I said. And there's no plan B. There's no planet B. That's why this is even more imperative. So let's get right down to it. I said most of my most of my slides are trash. This is an example of one in Brooklyn. Um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York right now. And I'll talk for a moment about New York City and textiles, um, but then we'll expand it out. But as just for some context, if we put New York City's textile waste together for one year, it would accumulate to be the size of the um, Empire State Building, which has 102 floors and which is 443 meters tall. Um, this is meaning that 200,000 tons of fashion was thrown away just in fashion waste, not even um, other 
bedding and towels and all that stuff. 200,000 tons of fashion waste genera generated by New Yorkers in one year. And that is, that's, uh, we're a fashionable place, but that is everywhere too. Here is a example of a Goodwill in Minnesota where 12 grocery carts of clothing and textile are trashed every minute. And where's all this stuff going? On, on one hand, it's going to the trash. Here's a, a, another landfill um, slide. It's going to the trash and people are sorting uh, through it and really trying to figure out what to do with all this. We'll talk about how things really don't decompose over time. Anything with um, polyester in it, which is like over 98% of our clothing can't decompose. Only natural fibers can decompose. And even if something is made with cotton, but it has 2% polyester, it still is out there forever. Polyester is is made from petroleum uh, and it's basically like plastic. Anything that has ever been out there, plastic is with us forever till some genius figure, figures out how to break that down. But so things are going to landfill or they're also being sent even worse than landfill in some senses is things are being sent to third world countries. Countries like Ghana and some South American country, countries are being inundated with our, with our waste, with things that we don't want anymore. We think, oh, let's give it to goodwill or pass it on. And in many cases, it's really killing the economies of these third world countries. It's killing the economies because the entrepreneurs that live in these cities that would, or that live in these countries that normally would be um, making their own clothing for their, the uh, local economy are when someone could get a, a t-shirt for a penny it it really kills that local economy and these mounds of clothing in landfill and in in these huge piles can actually be seen from space now maybe you guys have seen there's a lot of been a lot of trending stories about these big massive piles of um, textile waste that is in different parts of the world so it's really a tough situation we're basically over consuming buying too much um, not keeping it long enough and companies are on a cycle where we just keep buying more and more. The average U.S. consumer throws away 81 pounds of clothing every year. Again, remember, we don't want to throw anything away. There's a lot of places that will take things back now. And we're not even going to talk about greenwashing in this, in our time together, but some, uh, some people have said that when you can get a 24 percent coupon off at H&M for bringing back your clothing. That's like a greenwashing element too, where we're just asking people to buy more and more clothes. So it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough world out there. Um, the apparel industry's global emissions will increase by 50% by 2030. We are just, as I said, by um, producing more and not keeping it long enough. 92 million tons of textile waste is produced every year. This is worldwide. The number of times a garment is worn has declined by about 36% in 15 years. We'll talk about that too in a moment. The fashion industry is responsible for 20% of global wastewater. 20% of global wastewater. I want to talk about that number as well too. And it takes 20,000 liters of water to, to produce one kilogram of cotton. To make one t-shirt, someone can live off of for three years. And if we think of all the t-shirts that we have owned through our lifetime, water is a very uh, serious, uh, clean water is a really serious situation where many people within uh, the supply chain of where we're producing clothes um, don't have access to that clean water. A $500 billion is lost each year because of underwearing and failure to recycle clothing. We're in this really tough cycle where we have been producing too many clothes. Um, most companies don't are, are overproducing and not even selling everything, um, not even at full price or on sale. Um, and in some cases, brands have been called out for burning merchandise. Maybe you heard of Burnberry a couple of years ago or even H&M more recently that tried to get um, old inventory off the books by burning it. Um, in Burberry's case, they didn't want it to fall into the wrong hands since it was proprietary, proprietary, the Burberry's proprietary plaid. But in general, we are just making too much stuff. So, and in fact, the this is a debatable quote that you may or may not he have heard, and I want to talk about it. Many people have said that fashion is the second largest polluter on the planet. And 
this was actually one of those talked about facts that everybody w- was saying, oh, fashion is the second largest offender to the environment. But there was really no facts about this. In fact, when I was doing my MBA capstone, and I was trying to use this as my opener statement. And the only person that I can find that said this was Eileen Fisher. And so I was like, Eileen Fisher said it. So it must be true. I quoted Eileen Fisher with that. It turns out that it had been re taken out of context. We're actually not sure how bad it is for the environment. And it is a really hard thing. And by the way, it was second largest behind the oil industry. I think oil industry is still the largest. It's definitely worse in aviation. And we think about all the planes and how much greenhouse gas emissions they must produce. But in general, it's really hard to put a number on this. People aren't sure. There was a New York Times article written a couple of years ago by Vanessa Friedman about where, how this fact that we hear often can't really be justified. So in general, I want to bring awareness today, but I also want to bring you a little skepticism about when you hear certain numbers to also question them and where that information is coming from. So that's why I put a little asterisk there. That is often a misquoted fact. We really don't know. We do know it is extremely um, bad for the planet. We just can't really quantify it in that way. Um, Some things that we can really quantify though are fashion brands are producing twice the amount of clothes today than 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And the owner of some of these brands are some of the richest men in the world. So people that are making shorts and selling them for $5 are worth more money than oil tycoons. And that is because things are being produced at such a massive scale. And not only that, but also the profitability of the production is, is quite high. That is because we're not paying our workers properly throughout the supply chain. So I want to talk about that um, later as well. This is one of my most upsetting slides. And you can see this little boy who doesn't have any protection on him at all. He doesn't have any gloves or anything on his feet or even a mask to protect against all the dangerous chemicals and dyes that are in that are in this stream. There's a joke that a joke that in China we know what the color of the year is by what the river is, by the what the color of the river is behind some of the mills and tanneries and in the production houses in in Asia. And that's because of the runoff water that we're getting from production. Leather, making uh, the the production of leather is one of the most toxic things on the planet. But in general, in order to get color to adhere, we, and to be a vibrant and uh, stay with us after washing, we need to affix it. And that's often done with um, really noxious chemicals um, and materials. Even things like silk production that has been around for, you know, hundreds of years has evolved into um, uh, ways that it's really um, harmful to the workers within the supply chain. And so this is just one example. If you're interested in learning more about this, I read a fascinating book. I actually um, read this right after the conference in um, January. I think I brought it with me on the plane, but this is an amazing book to die for. And it's actually written by Alden Wicker, who has a great newsletter and site as well. Um, And anyway, how toxic fashion is making us sick and how we can fight back. And it was fascinating because being on a plane to come down to Orlando, the book starts out talking about flight attendants who actually had to sue their employers because the flight the because their uniforms were making them sick and if you think about flight attendants they're in a very controlled environment they're on a plane there's no really poor air circulation they're usually in their uniforms for 12 to 14 hours a day some people even have to sleep in their uniforms they're by their colleagues all the time even if they could get a if, if their uniforms were making them sick if, even if they got a pass a doctor's note to say they could wear alternative items, they were still around their colleagues all the time. There's a big class action lawsuits around the chemical, about some uniform, flight attendants' uniforms that were making them uh, sick. And so she, Alden, goes through the history of how this has come to be and some other big lawsuits and things that have really come to be over time, but really that we should all be thinking about if we ever have rashes or not feeling well it all it could be our clothes we just are, aren't in them as much as flight attendants are so they're a really um interesting uh case point to to look at from that perspective
So anyway, that's one book that I can recommend to you to die for. Another thing that I thought was just really important, especially in the golf world, is to have a conversation about microplastics. I don't know if you guys are familiar with microplastics or have heard about them before, but maybe you have heard that we are basically eating a credit cards worth of plastic every week. And it's disgusting to think about microplastics are everywhere. If you are drinking water from plastic bottle, it's like off gassing into your, into the water bottles. And by the way, you should try not avoid plastic water bottles for many reasons, but basically it takes more water to make a water bottle than is inside a water bottle. Cause that makes sense because you have to make the plastic and the, the wrapper and everything. But anyway, these microplastics are mostly coming from our clothing and synthetic textiles. But microplastics are like tiny t- plastics that we can't even see. You can't even see them under a microscope. They're so tiny, small. And they maybe you, the, the best way that I can explain it to you is if you've ever worn like a sweater and you get up from a couch, like a black couch, and you have a white sweater on, you stand up and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I just shed on the back of the couch. That's because the synthetic fibers that you have are actually like reaching off of your clothing. If you've done the wash, when we do wash, actually, they uh, the synthetic fibers start to break down. And most of what we're wearing is synthetic fibers. And they're breaking down and really going out to our waste, the water stream, and going out into our lakes and oceans. And now microplastics have been detected in everywhere. They've been detected in breast milk. They've been detected in Antarctica. They are everywhere. And imagine like little plastic, um, tiny beads in our lungs and everywhere in our bodies. It's really it's horrifying to, to think about it when you really start to dry down, dr- drill down. But most golf apparel, but I found this from Golf Digest, most golf apparel, about 95% is crafted using materials derived from virgin plastics polyester, nylon, elastane, these fabrics become so popular over the years in part because of their durability. But this also means that they're not biodegradable, as I mentioned earlier, but I'm reading from Golf Digest now, meaning that takes centuries to break down. Polyester, for example, is fabricated for petroleum and it's a non-renewable resource that's harmful to the environment through its life cycle and releases toxic chemicals and microfibers as it wears, especially alarming when you think about the largest organ on your body is your body and skin. And so anything that comes in contact with us. Once it's thrown away, the fabric refuses to break down. These plastics get trapped in landfills, oceans, harming people, animals, planets, and landscapes. Um, again, I found that from Golf Digest, but it's happening with all of our with all of our clothing. And if you look at these numbers, the largest percentage of where microplastics are coming from is our synthetic textiles. So this is a very serious um, issue overall and something to look out for. I want to men- make a mention that Golf Digest article talked about virgin plastics, and I'm going to talk about some things that you guys can look for. But one thing is really looking for re- recycled materials in general. If we can avoid virgin anything, um, virgin cotton made from recycled materials, all the better. There are some caveats to that and some issues where often we might need to add other material to it to make it last long enough and to be durable enough, but it's definitely a better move overall. So lots of good stuff here talking about. I also wanted to mention, you guys might not be aware of this. Actually, I really got a little bit obsessed about this thing called um, the de minimis, the de minimis loophole, which was actually passed under President Obama, but it changed the way that goods can come into our country and how businesses like Shein and Temu, which are super ultra fast fashion brands that are really like all online and just like taking over the world, they have, they're they taking advantage of this de minimis loophole, which is a government regulation that's made the, that changed the way that goods can come into the United States and anything can come into the United States under $800 and did not need to be checked anymore. There's very little regulations with goods and coming into the U.S., but now anything $800 doesn't even need to be checked at all. So if you have ever done, I don't know if you've ever bought anything on TikTok shop before. I hope not. I have a 13-year-old daughter who bought all of my Christmas presents on TikTok shop, and they came in these white bags from China, and it took two weeks. And I'm like, where are all these things coming from? Where's? And I'm realizing it's coming directly from China, which is basically all of Xi'an 
Daymu, TikTok shop, um, so many sites. Even I was on this site the other day. I don't want to get derailed too much. It looked like the preppiest dresses. And I went to the About Us section and I was like, oh, this is just a Chinese company that really had honed into what the American consumer wanted. And um, so there's been a lot of talk lately, I think. I took this slide from a uh, government official um, in Congress who was um, put together the Fighting for America Act of 2024, who is um, proposing to stop this loophole of um, clothing that wouldn't be, didn't have to be checked at all. And if you think that we had a problem with companies like Zara and other um, brands that we weren't getting checked properly and weren't following regulations about, which are very minimal at best, about what our goods could look like, it's even worse with companies like this. And having, and I actually think about the my presents that I got, I ended up throwing away all my TikTok shop presents because I didn't want them touching my skin after reading Alden Wicker's books. Anyway, just things to consider. But things aren't always like this though, right? We used to shop with basics. Like we, my, I don't even think my students like know what basics are, like basic white t-shirts. I joke that I bought a suit when I interviewed for in senior year of college and it lasted me till I was like 45. It wasn't even that well made. I think it was from Ann Taylor, but it was basic. It was camel collar. It lasted a really long time. We bought things that were investment pieces and that were basics. We also used to make our own clothes. We, we would Back in the day, we would know who was sewing our own goods, who was mending, who someone could mend them for us, even if it was our um, someone in our family. Uh, we also knew the farmers where things were grown. And actually, if you think about um, fashion, it's a largely agricultural industry. We basically grow our own clothes. Cotton and even wool and other materials are, are really agriculturally oriented. I was lucky. This is not a picture of that, but I was really lucky this summer I went to Cotton Incorporated and got to go to a cotton farm in North Carolina. And it was just really fascinating to see and makes me really even more so want to um, uh, work with natural materials. Um, but as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the past. And um, this is um, a snapshot, um, obviously pre-photos, but of what the cottage industry used to look like. We used to, there would be someone in our town, in our village, who would um, spin the yarn, someone in the back there who is um, boiling it down to clean it. Someone is then making it into turning into fibers and then turning into cloth. This would be different homes, the original cottage industries where someone would take it from home to home and build it into a final finished good. But along the way, we would these would all be neighbors that were participating in this. And it was uh, maybe Justine would be known for lace production and Megan might be known for weaving and up the cloth, uh, but we would all know uh, who was doing what. This all changed during the Industrial Revolution though. In the Industrial Revolution is a really interesting time um, because it really changed fashion forever, quite literally. Early industrialization had its roots in the power loom up on the left and other machinery that helped produce textiles into a much more massive scale than we ever knew before. Textiles actually used to be highly coveted. They would be passed down in people's wills as they were really expensive and highly regarded. But with these power looms, we were able to produce textiles in a much more massive scale than ever before. And then the more people needed different kind of types of clothing because they were moving to cities, they were working in factories. So this double-edged sword where this production also fed into this fashion system that started during the Industrial Revolution, where we also, we started to change even the status of what our clothing looked like changed because it, it was, it's, started to break down the barriers between rich and poor when we had the noble caste versus the rest of us. But so we have these big power looms being created. Then we have uh, fashion magazines. This is a little out of context because as a professor, Vogue did not start until 1892, but you get the idea of a fashion magazine. I wanted to put up something that everybody would know. The real one would be Godey's Ladies Book, which was one of the original um, fashion magazines, but you would get drawings of inspiration from Paris. And even if you were in Kansas City, Missouri, you can take um, those looks to your to your local seamstress or even your mom or grandmother, and she can make those for you. And I'm not even being sexist. That is just like how it was. And then other, other inventions, such as the cotton gin, spinning looms, the um, sewing machine in 1846, all kind of 
culminating together. The picture of the uniform there is to talk about standardization of sizes, which actually happened during the um, Civil War for the soldiers. Um, and otherwise, before then, everything was bespoke and custom made. And that was just for men's. So we really don't see ready to wear for women's until the early 1900s. Um, but we do also have the start of patterns where you would buy that, mag that fashion magazine and it would be a Butterick pattern. All this really start. this is 200 years right here in, in the making. I went really fast, but really escalating and uh, making this fashion cycle run even faster than ever and bringing it up into today's world where we are now in this fast fashion cycle. That was the first industrial revolution, industrial 1.0 that started in 1784, really in the UK, but there was some Americans that came over and saw this machinery and studied this machinery and brought it back to the US in like Lowell, Massachusetts and other parts of the country. And we know that actually it's a very dark time for America in some ways where we have cotton farming really and slavery as a big part of building the textile and fashion world. Um, People don't really talk about that too much either, but it plays into this idea that we still have, we still, we did, and we still do have labor issues in the United States and around the world. Um, we have, um, I'm going to talk really quick about these other industrial revolutions, 2.0, which is the mass production of the assembly line, electric energy introduction, industrial revolution, and that was... Um, then Industrial Revolution 3.0, the automation of computers and electronics. But then where we are right now, we, were we are currently in another Industrial Revolution 4.0, which is today where we are in the Internet of Things. We are in the AI world. Every day is like a hundred years span to where we were before in terms of how our, how our world is changing and, and how quickly things are. So we're in a really pivotal time. And we should we should be taking some of that knowledge and some of that automation and some of that technology into the fashion world. Instead, we are still built on a system where it is really hard to sew an armhole. It is really hard to make clothing look good. It's really hard for robots to do that. We are eventually going to get to that place. But until then, we have a lot of human touch in the fashion world. And that is where we also have a big breakdown of what our workers, our workers rights look like. So what we really need bringing it to the future is we need a mindset change. We need this mindset change um, where we are thinking more holistically about what, what we're buying, what we're consuming, what we're producing, what we're selling. And um, that's what I'm hoping to talk and get into your head a little bit today. The idea of the triple bottom line instead of just the bottom line, right? Why are we in business? We are in business. I don't know when I would ask my students, why are we in business? Most people will say we're in business to make money. And again, as I said in the beginning, we have to make money. We are um, even Yvonne Chouinard, who's the founder and visionary of Patagonia. We can't, if we're not making any money, we're not going to be a, a standard bearer for corporate America, right? So making money is important, but the idea that these three pillars, the planet and people in, within our supply chain, our stakeholders, if you will, are as equally as important as the profitability is a really thoughtful concept. And we actually call it the triple bottom line. Rather than the bottom line of just profitability, we, I'd like you to think about the idea of the triple bottom line. And even if that is thinking more thoughtfully about your coworkers and the people that are reporting to you or within your organization and thinking about what their schedules are like or how we can make sure that they are being treated as, as equitably as possible. We, uh, if you look up the triple bottom line after this, it is definitely going to look like this, people, planet, and profits. But what I would also challenge you to think about is instead of profitability, I would challenge you, little elevated thought here, to replace that with prosperity. Profitability for some on the pyramid or prosperity for more, uh, for all. 
And I, again, I'm thinking about the life cycle and the supply chain and all the different, from the farmer to the designer, which farmer and designer just never talk to one another in the current system, to the, the factory worker, to the person that's inspecting the goods and dyeing the fabric, and then bringing it to the store and working in the warehouse, all of those different people within the 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 system is what uh, I'm really talking about and making sure that they have a voice. And it's really easy to figure out how profitable we are, right? We can look up on our POS. My POS system every day tells me how profitable I am and compares it to last year, compares it to yesterday. Um, and we can, we hear from people. We definitely hear from our employees that are working for us, right? Someone's unhappy or they quit. And but some people are easily more heard than others. Some of those factory workers, they don't have a voice. We really need to do our best to vet brands and see where things are being made so that we know that voice is being heard. The planet, I would argue that the planet has, has no voice, although... I would also say she's completely screaming right now and saying we're on fire, right? It's like a beautiful day in New York City, although it's been the, hot, the hottest year on record. And so all of these things work in tandem together. So even though, again, I'm looking at it from the lens of making sure that we have a profitable business, it's very it's subtle differences in decision making across the from every decision that you make every day that you can really start to implement ideas about the triple bottom line. And I didn't even put a slide in here and I'm bummed I didn't, but there's a really important concept out there called the B Corp. And maybe some of the brands that you're looking for are B Corps. Maybe your golf shop can be a B Corp. I would look into B Corps, a really cool new, not that new, but new way of looking at a business where you can internally take a quiz. It takes about an hour and a half to take the quiz and you get a number and you want an 80 or below and you can, you get different points for different things, community, how you're treating your employees, all different kinds of things. But really you can look up different companies. Warby Parker is on there. I've mentioned Eileen Fisher in Patagonia on this call, you can look up that, their scores and see where they're where they are, and that's something that I am also looking at and looking forward to at my store as well. It's a journey, it's a process. So triple bottom line thinking. Another one is this idea, and maybe you guys have heard of this before: um, the circular economy. Right in the beginning, I showed you guys that slide of the linear economy where we're just going from take, make, waste, dispose. This is the idea of a loop. Maybe you've heard of um, a closed loop system or the circular economy, but this idea where we're really trying to avoid things from the dump, from the landfill. And in order to do that, we have to think about the, we have to begin with the end in mind. And it starts in the design phase. And Justine, when I talk to my students about the design phase, that's product development, that's buying, that is you guys, that is everybody on this call. You're making decisions about what you're gonna buy for your stores. But even, even before that, or the brands that you're deciding to work with. So it's um, looking for the better materials. It's looking for better garment manufacturing. It's looking for things that, when they break, you can easily repair them. Um, Patagonia is known for their repair shop, and they they repair everything, all of their goods. That Yvonne Chouinard says, you don't buy anything from Patagonia; you basically rent it because they'll re they'll repair it for you, and then when you're done with it, they'll also buy it back from you. That's how much they stand by their goods. But they also used to, real, they realized that repairing their zippers actually cost more money than a whole new jacket. So they worked with their repair shop to reimagine and the design team to reimagine and fi fix the way that the zippers were integrated into their clothing. So make it easier to fix the zipper, which was one of the number one reasons of returns and repairs. So rethinking all of those things along the way. And of course, there's tons of business models too that are popping up every day, not just repair and redesign and things like that. There's assembly businesses, but there's also rentals and resale shops that are actually resale is having a bigger heyday right now than retail. So different ways of reimagining what that end of life looks like as well. But overall, the arching idea, overarching idea is this idea that we're going from a linear system to a circular economy where we're avoiding things from going into the, the dump.
to going into that landfill. There is a lot of regulation happening worldwide, mostly in the European Union, where in the EU, there are like hundreds, almost hundreds of new regulations that being that's being passed about things as over overreaching as over consumerism. You can't burn any goods anymore. Transparency and supply chain, so many different factors, marketing, so many different elements. Um, we are about 10 years behind, hopefully 10 years behind the, the European Union. There has been some um, legislation that's been passed in the U.S. Um, or proposed in the U.S. There's couple that have been passed. One is about China from a region, I'm sorry, cotton from a region in China called the Xinjiang region, um, which um, where a great deal of China is one of the largest cotton suppliers to the world. And Xinjiang cotton is one of the largest regions in China that's supplying cotton. So the chances of us having cotton from this area are very high, but this area is is all um, slavery. It is just the, the worst stories about human the human condition and the way that people, the Uyghurs, are being treated in this area of Xinjiang, China, if you want to research that more. And so that cotton has been, that was actually a bipartisan move, I think in 2021, that the Xinjiang cotton is illegal, but it's very hard to figure out where that China and the transparency of the cotton bells is very difficult because the chain of command, and now I've been to the cotton farm, so I realize how hard it is to keep one bale from um, Megan's farm separate from my farm, so very difficult. There was something also introduced in the in New York called the New York Fashion Transparency Transparency and Social Accountability Act. It was posed a couple years ago now, unfortunately. Uh, the person that first introduced it went on to run a bigger campaign, and then our governor also was running a campaign, and it has not, it's been tweaked and working on, but it would mean that even though it's in the state of New York, this would be for every company that is making $100 million or more, they would have to show transparency in their supply chain in 12 months. And within 18 months, they would have to show different ways to that they were improving on that. I know we're getting close out of time, so I'm just going to run through a few more slides and then we'll have some time for Q&A. But so look be on the lookout for fashion regulations out there um, and some ideas about ways that you can um, connect and take some of these ideas that we talked about today. One is slow fashion, the idea that we know where our goods we are coming from. We know the maker, we know even the farmer, or we know the designer, or we know the manufacturing partners where instead of fast fashion, I think there's a lot of food food relevancy here too. We think of fast fashion and fast food and slow food. It's things we get from the farmer's market and we grow it ourselves. So think about that where we have a connection. If you find a brand and you can tell their story and maybe they can even come in and do a trunk show and explain where their thought process was or where they get their materials or their recycled bags um, or something within that. I think that would that's a really, even if we just start with one brand like that and see how it catches on and but we also have to uh, explain it to our customers and through signage and through being more um, open about what that looks like. Um, and golf, I think, has a natural edge because you're selling some timeless clothing that lasts a really long time. That's really could be years, used for years. Um, I know we want to have, always sell the latest and greatest, but also a lot of things that you're buying are investment pieces. A pair of good golf shoes are going to last a really long time, right? Things that are going to be with us um, for a while are also, that's another really important way to, I don't want to say sell the sustainability story, but really that's what we're doing is reimagining what what that what sustainability looks like it doesn't always just have to be eco preferred materials or it could be a, a mix of all of these different things together textile innovations though are one of the biggest ways that we are seeing the the most rapid growth in this world we there's some really cool amazing things that are being done in this world and a lot of it is coming from leftover um, food <laughs> we are getting amazing textiles from things like orange peels and 
and pineapple Pinatex leather is actually scaled now and is at, has been at H&M and other stories. There's mushroom leather. There's so many different new spider silk, which is actually not from spiders, but mimicking what that looks like, but so many innovative textiles. And I'm sure there's so many too that could be in that are helpful in the golf world from wicking and different ways that we could stand up and have a long life as well. And then also looking at that, the production, where things are made and being maybe even asking the questions when you're buying things from a line is like starting that conversation. Oh, okay. Our customers are starting to ask where things are made. Let's be more transparent about where our goods are coming from. And this is an amazing site if you're interested in learning more called Fashion Revolution. It was actually started after the Rana Plaza collapse, which was, I think now 10 years ago in Bangladesh, where over... 1,100 people lost their lives in a factory collapse, which could have been completely avoided. It's a really awful story. If you're not familiar with it, um, you should um, do a little digging on that. It was such an awful event where this factory owner built a extra stories on top of this factory that weren't regulated. He bribed someone to let this let these extra floors happen the day before this huge collapse happened. People inside the factory noticed that there was big cracks in the in the walls. But the factory manager was like, no, just go back in, just go back to work. And then the next day, the whole thing came crumbling. That's just like sick, sickening what's happening around the world. And this is in Bangladesh right now. So they actually have this day, April 24th every year, which was the day of the factory collapse, where they ask um, people to turn their clothes inside out and ask where, who made my clothes. And these are some factory workers that are saying, I made my clothes. Um, and I just added some extra resources at the end. Um, Earth.org is where a lot of my um, uh, statistics came from today. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation is an amazing organization founded on the principles of circularity. And they have a ton of information. They really have a huge focus on fashion. Good on You is a... Um, organization um, that has a great app. They are out of Australia, but they have a ton of American brands on there. They also have a great newsletter and you can learn a lot about different brands. Mentioned Sourcing Journal on my pre-call because I'm obsessed with Sourcing Journal. I find the most information about fashion and not just sourcing or sustainability, but just in general, I feel like they're always on the post. Business of Fashion Revolution. I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Linda wrote in the chat, she wrote, interesting presentation. Thank you for sharing. Well, I just want to say, if you guys have not seen True Cost, the movie, that is like really mm -hmm. eye-opening as well. Yes, that is a good one to, to dive in a little deeper, definitely. Actually okay. based off of the, bang, the Rana Plaza collapse. Yeah. The director didn't know anything about the travesties of the fashion industry before that. But um, anyway, really interesting. Yes, definitely. Are there any questions you would recommend if a buyer was wanted to start that conversation with maybe it's a new to them vendor or a vendor they want to continue working with? And what might be some of those key questions? Would it be starting with where are your goods made? What does that look like? Any good questions for them? Yeah, I think you can start just asking them, what do you, how, how much, how aware are you of your supply chain and where you're, who, but who are your manufacturing partners? Mm. Um, I think more than, sadly, only 20% of brands really know where their goods are made and can follow things. I, above the tier, there's four tiers of the supply chain and the first tier back with the manufacturer and then the fabric most people can't trace even beyond the manufacturer so asking where things are made even where their materials are coming from do they have any eco preferred options do they what are their plans for the future if they don't have anything i think it's important to not just not work with somebody because they're not in that space right now but starting the conversation and opening the dialogue and in fact even maybe supporting that company if they're changing oh you know what we actually have a capsule collection that might have some materials that you might be interested in and trying just trying things out like that I think it would be it's a hard move it's people just have to start asking the, the, the right questions about supply chain and materials and it's hard to find the brands out there I'm, I'm not gonna lie and some of them are also more expensive they don't necessarily need to be more expensive. Just everything else is too cheap. 
And that's also a discussion. That's a whole other thing about pricing in the world, but that's a good start, hopefully. And how about things that are made in America? Is that something that comes with its knowing we'd have a little bit more transparency there? Is that something that buyers should look out for as well? That is a really complex question, Justine. I actually, made in America is not always a good thing either. There are sweatshops here. The first sweatshops ever were in the United States on the Lower East Side, but there are, we don't really have good practices here either. Mm -hmm. One of the things that did get passed, and actually California is a big producer. Most things that say made in America are most often made in California. A lot of jeans are made in California. Um, LA, downtown LA has a big fashion um, district where they're actually producing clothes. Uh, They did pass one of those legislations. I think it was in 2021 where they went from being paid by the piece to to a more hourly rate because they were not paying a good rate either. I also just want to say made in America with made with uh, materials made in the U.S. that hardly ever exists. <laughs> it is always with imported fabric. Mm. Made in America, materials made in the U.S. production. We are, sadly, that is not even happening at, at scale, for sure. Usually might be made in America with imported materials. It's a really complex. This subject is the most complex and it takes all the time. And you can't just say, shop here or buy this it is so nuanced and it's so it's not just black and white there's it's so much gray area that um it's just a it's a really interesting area and to learn about and even as i said about there's a lot of fake news out there that second largest offender to the environment it's that you can't always, you really have to go to the, the source and figure out if that's even a reputable um, organization. There was a big cotton a report out about cotton is noted. Most people would say cotton is the most toxic crop on the planet. We didn't even really talk about this, but it's because it's really hard to grow cotton without having a lot of pesticides to to grow it, let alone the, the process of retrieving the cotton and then cleaning the cotton and bleaching the cotton, all that. But there's also a lot of upside to cotton as well. So a very complex subject. <laughs> Absolutely. We got one more question in the chat here from Brad. He wrote, how big are PFAS restrictions coming into play. We're a vendor and we're already seeing customers ask for commitment or guarantee that no PFAS materials will be used in the near future. Yeah, that's a really good question. I know I teach a little bit about green chemistry, but I'll be honest, Brad, when I do that, I have a green chemist come in and talk about PFAs. Um, but, and in the, in, and I learned about more of them with the Alden Wicker book, um, but as far as I know now, there's not much regulation here in the United States. So I, I can't give more any more information along those lines, but I'm glad your customers are pushing back and figuring things out. I, I wish I had more information. I do know a green chemist at FIT. If you want me to put him in touch, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being able to talk about, I'm obviously really passionate about this subject. It's so important. And um, I'm really grateful that you guys were here on a a Wednesday in the middle of August to talk about this and hopefully you got some good takeaways. Absolutely. We were so delighted to have you again after having you at our conference in January. So thank you so much for lending your time to help our members learn a little bit more about this. And hopefully it will inspire everyone to dig deeper with all these great additional resources you shared to learn more. So thank you everyone for joining us and taking an hour out of your day to attend this AGM education. And thank you again to Professor Cantrell for presenting. And we hope to see you all again soon at future AGM events. Take care, everyone.